We'll get that or in the Q&A window and we will get to them. So with that, I wanted to say welcome to Startup Funding Sources with Fundica, OCI, and Equivesto. I've got a great lineup here. And we're not talking about VC funding and angel investors. We're talking about all the other types of funding you can get. And uh, why don't we start with you, Alex, from Equivesto. Tell us about you and Equivesto. Thanks, Craig. Uh, I'm a co-founder and managing director of Equivesto. Equivesto is a Canadian equity crowdfunding platform. So we help companies uh, and entrepreneurs raise funds and get direct investment from their own communities from between 25,000 all the way up to 1.5 million. And you can let your community of supporters become investors in your business uh, from as little as $100. So Equivesto is a platform uh, and we've got new deals all the time uh, raising capital from their communities. So that's me. Yeah, and I've uh, recently talked to a, uh, a few of your startups that have been very successful. It's a, it's a, um, seems to be growing option for people here in Ontario. That's great. Uh, Mike, tell us about uh, Fundica. Sure. So uh, my name is Mike Lee. I'm president of Fundica. We started uh, the company's incorporated just about four years ago, and over the last uh, two years, we've really developed an online solution that is being used now by a number of banks. Uh, I'll kind of mention our most recent additions so on the last couple of weeks. We welcome Meridian Credit Union, Venture Kamloops. Uh, we have actually seven different municipalities that signed up as well. Um, and soon we'll be launching in the US. So Fundica really helps these different entities um, provide a better experience for the entrepreneurs that, that they work with, uh, provides more information on what these entrepreneurs are doing. And as well, at the same time, helps the entrepreneurs identify the best funding available. Thanks. And we want to introduce Manny from OCI. Tell us a little bit about OCI, not OCE, and yourself, Manny. Lovely. Good afternoon, guys. My name is Manny Kalia. I work for the organization called OCI, Ontario Center of Innovation. And uh, so we are funded by provincial governments. So that's where the funding is coming from. And our main goal is to help our startup or even the SME to get to the next stage. How we can help them commercialize the IP they are creating or technology they are creating. That's our overall goal for us. Um, I always talk about the three pillars that we have is the innovation, entrepreneurship and collaboration. So collaboration, when I talk about it, it's a collaboration between industry to industry, but also industry to academia as well. Like we fund every single university, colleges or research hospitals in province. So sometimes what happens is like a, we are trying to come up with the new product or technology. We are trying to do it in house. That's where like a, we can play a role. We can help you connect with some of these uh, academia and accelerate your growth. And then later on help you commercialize those products and technology as well. So do come and talk to some of the like a BDs that we have. We are 55 of us all over Ontario. Please do talk to them. And then we will help you create a roadmap, how we can help you get to the next stage. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, that was a great uh, introduction. Mike, I'm going to start with you. You know, I get a lot of questions about people. Um, where do I find grants? Where do I find loans? How do I know what tax credits apply to me? You know, how hard is it to find these things for your startup? Yeah, well, I think there are thousands of programs out there, like programs from OCI, um, there are lots of different crowdfunding solutions. There are there's lots of additional funding sources. So I think first and foremost, you need to really have a tool that can help you identify what are the most relevant funding sources. So Fundica is one of those tools. There's some other tools out there, but really kind of relying on that along with potentially people who can help you advise you on what are the best funding solutions. People can waste a lot of time on this identification stage. So we really try to help with that. And I think that's an important thing to do. Um, in terms of what's out there, there's grants, there's tax credits, there's loans, there's loan guarantees, there's equity. So there's a whole kind of range of different funding. But at the end of the day, especially for early stage startups, there's generally only a few uh, sources that really make a lot of sense for them. Um, you know, if you kind of get later on, you get past that very, very early stage, then more sources typically open up. But at the beginning, there are a few. Um, in terms of the ones that often kind of overlooked at the beginning, I would say when you're really starting out, it's a lot of the grants, tax credits are based on the expenditures you're incurring. So the first few expenditures are probably going to be on 
either subcontractors or employees. So those grants to get to pay for part of that employee or sometimes that student employee, um, those are often the ones at the very beginning that are kind of overlooked. They're the ones that you really kind of want to make sure you, you get and get you going. As you get it further in, there are other programs that would, would come up. I actually have a follow-up question on that, Mike. Sorry to, to interrupt. Um, sure. When it comes to sort of applying for those kind of grants, I is there a certain time of the year that you really have to be sort of ready to be applying for those? Or can you apply to those grants any time during the year? So it is kind of important to understand which ones are available. The government year end uh, is right now, so end of March. So there's a new money envelope that comes in the beginning of April. So there's a number of programs where you want to get in all within the beginning of April. Uh, a classic example would be IRAP. So IRAP is going to get a whole bunch of new money and they're going to really be, you know, open for business for new, for new funding really starting April 1st. So you want to get in line now. Um, mm. This is a very timely chat we're having. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and then there are some that are for summer students and there are deadlines for those. There's a few different programs. Um, so those would be other ones that are out there. Uh, but some of them, it's kind of ongoing. It's throughout the entire year. So it would, uh, so really important to look at what the deadlines are and to kind of act accordingly. And for the most part, for these kind of hiring grants, especially, it's kind of just getting in line, which is one of the most important things. They're generally not that hard to, to get if you qualify, but you do need to get in line. So you are one of the ones who are able to receive the money. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So I can add to the same thing, actually, because like he mentioned, the government fiscal year. So that's the same thing for OCI programs as well. So April is when the, like we will be allocating lots of funding to different programs. But so what happened is by November, December, uh, because we have lots of demands, sometimes some of our programs are actually kind of a full. And then we become really choosy. And then you guys will start seeing it. We will be asking for 200 kind of information before we grant one application. So it's always good if we are applying for any government programs to so aim for like a start in April and then get it done by May, June, July for sure. Like uh, don't expect mainly with the IRAP, I do know that like they run out of the money really quickly because they are already allocating the money for the next year. So please be in the lineup for that for sure. It's definitely one thing you don't want to put off. I don't know how many stories of, yeah, we got plenty of money. Yeah, we got plenty of money. Nope. Sorry, we're closed <laughs> <laughs> from grant programs because it's just the way it goes. So don't wait. Um, uh, Alex, let's go back to the basics. Can you describe what the funding cycle looks like for a startup? Yeah. So, so typically, you know, uh, you've just, you've just got the idea that you're working on, you're, you're getting started. Uh, so at this point you're at the sort of pure ideation stage and you're going to try to get a little bit of money scraped together to kind of get what you need to sort of get off the ground. So either you're going to fund this yourself, uh, or you're going to fund this sort of from family and friends at this point to sort of build out your, your initial first product, your minimum viable product, or the, the first iteration of your service or, or website, whatever it is, um, after that, you're probably at the time where you can start doing a, either a pre-seed or a seed round. So this is the first time where you're you're sort of going externally to to raise capital, and there's a few different options to to help there. Um, and that's usually when you're starting to get you know uh, several hundred thousand is usually when you're looking for the sort of pre-seed seed money. It's different if you're in Silicon Valley. I just want to highlight, so don't be quoting me numbers from from Silicon Valley and saying, oh, but this guy you know with a pitch deck raised two million US. In Canada, it's a little bit different. So in Canada. Uh, you're a couple hundred thousand for your pre-seed or seed. And then uh, your series A is your first really large round where you're going for uh, big sort of like venture capital kind of money where you're looking for uh, usually a million plus at that point. And at that point, you, you've already got uh, revenue, you've got sales, you've got growth of some kind, and then you use sort of series A and then all the other letters after that to kind of further uh, accelerate and uh, increase your growth. Was that kind of what you're looking for, Craig? Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. No problem. Manny, um, what types of funding programs does uh, OCI offer? So we do have a, like a different initiatives in the different fields. So we are calling it um, kind of a funding. We are trying to stay away from the word grant from these days. What happened is like uh, 
all their funding programs are mainly now one-to-one -one match. Like a company is bringing half of the match and we will try to match it. So one few of the programs that every company should be testing is like a, in a 5G environment. So whenever I talk about 5G, people think about, oh, it's a mobile. No, it's not. We want to test our technology and platform in a 5G environment and see how it will perform. So we are ready for tomorrow. So that's why in Ontario, we have opened three test beds, one in Ottawa, one in Toronto, and one in Waterloo, where we are giving access to the, providing access to the company so they can test their technology and see how it will perform. Last three years, we were actually providing some funding towards those projects as well, but it's gonna be closing on this March because we have, like it was a three year program. So the funding is completed right now. Uh, so what we were doing in the last year was we were actually providing 50,000 towards the project and the company will bring 50,000. So they can do their testing, they can develop some of the technology and test it in a 5G environment and see how it's gonna be performing. Uh, there's another program that every startup or new company should test is, it's a, we call it like a NGNP. I can send you guys the link on the, like a later on. So this is a scale up for a stress testing. So what happened is with a startup is like a, we build a platform, we might have thousand people on a platform, but if we wanted to see how our platform will perform if we are bringing 1 million or 2 million users onto the platform. So we are also providing access to the people so they can simulate it and test it. What happened with some of our startup is they wanna go demonstrate their technologies to the big guys. Uh, let's just use FinTech because we're just talking about it. So the five banks, if you wanna present your technology to them, they're gonna ask you these kind of a question. Yeah, your platform can handle thousands, but our platform, we need like a 1 million people going every single hour, can, can it handle it? So that's some of the testing they can do on the simulation test beds. And this organization, they can even write a report on it or provide a testimonial. That will be really helpful for the organizations as well as they grow. Um, so there's a, like a different streams. We have several different streams, but I don't wanna bombard everybody with lots of numbers, but please sir, check our website and reach out to us and we will be happy to walk you through it. And I put the link to the uh, Next Generation Networking Program in the uh, chat room there and on Google, uh, sorry, Google, YouTube Live. Um, back over to you, uh, Mike. Um, what types of funding do you find are uh, most overlooked when um, people are start for startups? Yeah, so I do think that the, um at the beginning, the hiring programs, which are quite easy, they're not necessarily that valuable. We're talking about a few thousand dollars. Those ones, because sometimes people kind of go, ah, you know, I got to do all this work for a couple of times. It's often very easily done. It's just a question of put your, what is the job posting, put a bit of your administrative information, answer a couple of questions. So those ones are good ones for startups that are often overlooked. Um, I think another one that's often overlooked is the some of the tax credits. So in particular, the R&D tax credit, it's a, quite a bit of funding. And sometimes people think, oh, it's a lot of trouble. It's a lot of work. I may have Revenue Canada come in, but the truth is it can be a significant amount of money. So the return on investment could be quite good. Um, some of the ones I'd be very careful are, are some of the ones that are, and they're, they're maybe overused in some cases. I would be careful with some programs. There, there's a very big application process. I probably won't, I don't want to say too many bad things about some of them. They're good programs, but the application process may take you weeks and weeks and weeks. So you really got to know what you're doing before you, you get into those. So those are typically ones where it may be for you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but they're very specific and they're sometimes very limited in terms of funding. So those are the ones where I see people are the most disappointed, you could say, because they spent a lot of time and they didn't get anything out of it. So uh, most overlooked, probably hiring ones, potentially in the, the tax credits, the R&D tax credits in particular, uh, most overused and, you know, ones you need to be careful with are the big application uh, programs in, in my mind. And maybe if you're applying for um, a big application program, you might want to get some help from a professional who's done it before. Yeah, at least to say, you know, am I doing the right thing? Am I going the right way? Uh, and and it, it'd be a pleasure to help someone else say, hey, I'm about to apply for this the CMF. CMF is a big application. Just one example. Great program, big application, but if you don't kind of fit right in the box, you, you probably shouldn't be doing it. 
you know, four out of five companies will not be accepted based on historical application rates. So you really want to be intelligent on that one. Alex, when should a startup consider equity crowdfunding? It's a great question, Craig. Um, to be honest, the, the timing for equity crowdfunding, if you're using it as the main source of capital raising for your business, you're actually uh, constrained by the current regulations in place. So equity crowdfunding is uh, very much regulated by the securities commissions in each province. And there's maximum amounts that can be raised uh, through equity crowdfunding from the general public. Uh, and depending on you know, what legal framework you use, they can be slightly different in each province. Um, but I would generally say if you're looking to raise more than 1.5 million from the sort of the general public, or, or you're looking to raise more than 1.5 million in general, sorry, then uh, you're probably beyond uh, where equity crowdfunding is a fit, uh, especially if you're going for the general public. Uh, the most efficient set of rules for equity crowdfunding actually um, goes up to 500,000 in two campaigns of 250,000 uh, per year. So I would say if you're looking sort of at that pre-seed, your, your sort of first round after you've built your minimum viable product, that's really a great space for uh, equity crowdfunding, especially if you have a community of support uh, around that. Alternatively, if you have an existing operating business and what you want to do is reward and sort of bring and allow your community to sort of come in and become investors, that's when equity crowdfunding can also be quite valuable. So if you're operating uh, more of a small business or something like that, like a restaurant or a bar, equity crowdfunding can be very effective to kind of reward your longstanding patrons, allow them to become investors and also bring in some capital. And also if you have a sort of more community-based company, potentially um, like a skincare line or something like that, where you're, you have very active users and they're excited about your product, then potentially rewarding them by letting them become investors um, would be a good fit for equity crowdfunding. Yeah. And if, if I can add in, Craig, I think the one thing I see with startups is very important to do is to follow certain steps in terms of funding. So first thing, look, do I have some kind of market fit? Do I really have a viable solution? Secondly, do I have a, a bit of a team Third, I need a bit of money. Even if you're going to get some crowdfunding, you're going to get some grants from tax credits, you need some money to start with. So those are kind of the pre-funding steps. For, for And then when you get into the funding steps, go see if there's government funding. It doesn't mean apply for anything, but go see what's there. That's the cheapest, should be the easiest. Next, go see if there's anything you can get from, from banks and kind of debt. Uh, difficult with most startups, but some cases you can get it. And then lastly, you want to kind of go to the equity. So really want to follow those steps. Equity crowdfunding is awesome, but you know you do want to kind of get the steps in line. And if you can get those other steps validated, it's going to help you when you do go for the equity crowdfunding or any kind of later stage kind of funding. Yeah, Mike uh, raised a really good point there, certainly. With, with equity crowdfunding, it's definitely not a fit for every company. And even as part of our due diligence and onboarding process, we have lots of minimum requirements for companies. Um, we try to make it as open as possible, but you definitely need to have, you know, need to be incorporated. You need to have your minimum viable product already developed and some sort of demonstrable traction. And whenever, you know, you go out to look for funding, you want to think about looking for types of funding that fit your business model, what your business is doing, and, and you want to try to find non-dilutive funding first. And what I mean by that is if you can go out to the government and get some money from the government without having to give up any ownership control of your business, that's probably a better fit, uh, especially if that's easy and, and, and you know, you can get that faster. Um, obviously with the banks, then you're taking on debt. So you want to think about, you know, that again, that's non-dilutive. So you're not giving up control, but it might put a bit of uh, additional pressure on cash flows because you need to manage your debt. So definitely equity crowdfunding is not a fit for every business. That's not my goal. I'm not, you know, car salesman, come to my lot. I guarantee there's a car for you. That's not our approach. Um, equity crowdfunding can be really helpful for certain types of businesses. And, uh, you know, if you talk to us, we're happy to, you know, redirect you in another direction if you're not a fit for us. No, I'm glad we are talking about it. Like, uh, that's, this is something we always tell, tell the entrepreneurs in the beginning, like a bootstrap it as much as you can, but also look at it, how we can accelerate the growth. So, so we always say, okay, for three, like a friend's family and fools in the first round, 
And then the second round is, okay, let's look at the incubators or sometimes the pitch competition, wherever we can grab a little bit of a money. And then we go to the angel round. I always tell, don't try to give your equity too quickly because in the beginning, your valuation is not high enough. Try to be, as an entrepreneur, like try to be on a safe side as much as you can. Try to go through promissory notes or angel routes. And then you can go by the time you read, like a, after pre-seed, you're gonna be seed round. That's where you should be thinking about, okay, I can, now I can give a little bit of equity away. But calculate those things before you start the business, like how much allocation. Last thing you wanna do is by the time you reach series B or series C, you have less than 50%, then you are actually just working for the investors. You want to be an owner. So make sure you have already plan these equities. How much am I giving? How much option pool I have? And uh, as a CEO, this is a one feedback I always give it to everybody. Never, ever run out of cash, no matter what happens. You might have the best technology, best platform. You run out of cash, there's going to be sharks swirling around you like crazy. So please, that's your job to make sure you are always cash flow positive. So think about even having a 12 months of runaway. Always plan about, okay, that's when I need to raise. And this is how much I need. This is my burn rate. I need to raise this much so I can like, a. if we are bleeding, we're never going to be creative. So have a cash in your hands for sure. A great uh, point. And um, working on that theme, our first question here from the audience is, uh, you know, can you give an idea of payback per terms for OC funding? Is it equity funding? Is it loans? How does it work? So we do have a, like a different program. So when we say funding, so that's just like a another word for grants, right? Like we are not asking for anything back, but what we will ask you guys is to provide us a report that you guys are generating a revenue in the province or you guys are trying to create jobs in the province. So that's what the ROI we will be measuring our projects with, right? So that's not, but we do have one uh, program, or I call it a portfolio, where we invest in the organizations. Uh, the our main like a mandate is to like uh, invest in the companies who are commercializing IP coming out of uh, academia, somebody's spin off, or there's an emerging technology, but they have a strong IP behind it. So we do like a 20 to 30 investments a year all over Ontario. And so we do invest in it, but we are always a secondary investors. We are never a lead investor. We'll try to match the terms that companies are coming with and we'll match those terms. Um, payback time is always like a, we will, so most 80% of our deals start with a promissory notes. So we will convert in the next raise. If they raise more than 1 million, we will convert into a share. So, we want our company to be continuously growing. So if it's a series A or series B, we might actually try to exit from the like a company. Whatever the money we make, we will reinvest in more companies in Ontario. So that's what we are continuously circulating the money into more startups. Great, thank you for uh, the detailed answer. That's um, amazing. Uh, Alex, we had a question for here. Oh, I'm not sure if you can, um, yeah, where can they're see. going with this. Does Equivesto have a Kickstarter funding model? Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly what they mean by Kickstarter funding model, but I'll sort of describe what our model um, is. Essentially, Equiveso is licensed as an exempt market dealer. And so uh, as part of that license, we can essentially broker uh, an investment from an investor, including the general public in a company. And so part of uh, raising money for companies using this model, uh, the government actually forbids us from charging any fees to investors. Um, that's sort of the rules around equity crowdfunding. And so what we do is we charge a percentage of the total raise amount to the company that's raising capital through the platform. Uh, so we, we outlined the, the fees and everything on our website, but it's entirely free for investors. So an investor coming in, bringing, let's say, $100, um, the, the $100 uh, is purchasing the, the shares of the company. And so your $100 of cash going in gets you $100 worth of shares. The company would get uh, less than the $100 because they would get the $100 minus our brokerage fee. So uh, I see you clarified a little bit your question. Uh, Kickstarter gets funds from customers for early access to the product. Yeah, so Kickstarter, there's three different types of crowdfunding. So there's rewards-based crowdfunding, 
there's donation-based crowdfunding, and there's equity crowdfunding. So Kickstarter is a rewards-based crowdfunding platform. So you're putting your money in to basically pre-order a product or some sort of re physical reward. Um, that's Kickstarter. The donation-based crowdfunding is uh, where you're doing it sort of out of the goodness of your heart in, in the US, sadly, because of their medical industry the way that it is. A lot of GoFundMes are to help uh, raise for medical bills. So that's an example of a donation-based crowdfunding. Equity crowdfunding, uh, you're buying equity, you're buying shares, ownership in the business. Uh, so just the same way a, an angel investor would or a, a dragon on Dragon's Den or something like that, the way that they are buying into and getting some ownership of the business, that's what you're doing with equity crowdfunding. It's uh, investing in a company uh, at an early stage. So there, it's definitely high risk. Uh, we have lots of disclosure about that. Um, but it is really the first opportunity for the general public to be able to have access to and invest in exciting startups really at that early stage point. So it's, it's not uh, rewards based like Kickstarter, it's its own thing where you're getting uh, partial ownership of the business. Mike, you um, pitch competitions have come up a few times. And so I thought I'd throw this over to you being, you know, the uh, arbiter of the roadshow, as it were, um, do pitch competitions, do they actually help startups get funded? So I think what, to be fair, what pitch competitions do more than anything is I think they educate both the companies pitching and the audience as to uh, how to actually talk to investors, what to say, how to put it all together. So I think if anything, at, at I think first and foremost, even the Fundica Rocho, it was to educate, inspire and fund. Um, so the first objective, which really hit most entrepreneurs was the education side. So what do you need to put together to really have something that's fundable, to really have a business that could be successful? And I think a lot of the startups, although many came in hoping I get a millions of dollars, I think to be very fair, only a few get funded. Um, the, the majority of them there actually learn from it. I mean, some get inspired and kind of go on to actually start companies of their own. And then just the few actually get the funding. So it's, it's like a pyramid, you know, everyone should be getting educated, hopefully. Some people will get inspired, hopefully a lot of them as well. And then you know, just the few would get, get funding and, and that's just the kind of the way it works. But I don't know if people know that coming in. Sometimes people come in and people think, oh, well, we're all getting money. This is just a big money hand out. It's very hard, it's very hard, especially equity investing. It's, it's the toughest kind of money to get. Um, but, uh, but people do get funded and every year we had prizes and people, there were millions of dollars getting, putting, getting put into companies, uh, but it was definitely a minority, a small minority. But I'll encourage entrepreneurs to actually go through the pitch, pitch competition is the feedback they're gonna get, that will get them ready when they are raising the angel round. Or uh, sometimes you even find a strategic investors actually sitting in the audience. So I always tell people, okay, just be outside. You want to demonstrate your technology to people, go on to those pitch competition and just talk about your product. You might even yeah. hear something back, okay, this is how you should describe your product better. So it's always good to get feedback from everyone. Yeah, it was an interesting story. We had one company, it used to be called Grade Slam, now it's called Paper. Um, the first year they applied, uh, we didn't actually accept them. The second year we, we put them in because somebody dropped out. So they actually filled in to get the pitch. They did okay. The third year, uh, they actually won. Um, and by the fourth year, they'd already raised millions of dollars. So, you know, the whole process took a very long time, like most startups do. And for the most part, it was just educating, getting better and better and better. And not just in physically pitching, but in terms of the business model, in terms of the team they built, in terms of what they were doing, um, they just got better and smarter and, and today they're doing very well. So it was a really fun story to see, but they definitely got mostly education out of it. And, you know, funding was just something they got at the end. Great. Manny, um, you know, hearing some of what you, what OCI does can make a startup intimidated. You're talking about, okay, well, tech is on our 5G center or our scalability center. Um, when should a startup start talking to you? Like how early, how late? Okay, 
I didn't mean to intimidate anybody, actually. So we work with uh, like uh, all stages of a company. We have our uh, like a uh, pro programs for everyone. We work with uh, like a company who's like a just a one or two people company, like a person company, all the way from Bombardier to Magna. Those are our clients as well, right? But I always tell companies as soon as they have an MVP ready, they should start conversing with the ecosystem players and say, this is what I'm planning to do. Just talk about your business model, talk about your revenue models and go in front of them. And what like OCI can help you out with is like, we can help you even dot connection. That's a big terms we use all the time. It's 55 of us all over Ontario. We have offices in every single city you can think of in Ontario. And we meet with the company, we know their pain points. And if your solution can be like connected to somebody, we will be happy to make those introductions. It's always good to have a warm introduction. So think of OCI as a, like a dot connectors rather than the funding organizations. And just, you should be in front of them, talk about it, this is what we are trying to build. This is the direction we are going. And those, like uh, some of the business development managers, they work with every single profs or university. They know what the trends are, what new things are coming, which direction people are moving towards. They might be able to guide you through it. So please like uh, have a conversation with them, stay in a loop. Like uh, you might not, like uh, they might not be able to help you in the first day, but just stay in a loop. Just say quarterly, I, you mind if I just touch base with you and this is where we are right now. And they might be able to help you guide you, put together a roadmap for you and how to take advantage of it. Um, I know Mike was talking about the, even the talent. In the beginning, everybody needs a talent. So there is a few program from OCI as well. Like a, we used to have a program called Talent Edge, where we will provide some funding towards hiring the new talent as well. So that two initiative I was talking about 5G and NGNP. We also have a Talent Edge part to it. So if somebody's hiring the new new graduates and stuff, we will provide some funding towards their salary as well, up to 30,000 per year for those candidates. Um, there's another organization called MyTax. Please, everybody should take advantage of that as well. They help you get some of the students in the university that can help you accelerate developing your technology as well. So please take advantage of whatever the funding is available, but uh, do talk to OCI or any of the government institutions. Just have like a 10 minutes cup of coffee with them and just let them know this is what you are working on. And uh, they'd be happy to meet with you guys. Thanks for that. That's great. Everybody should st talk, start talking to you uh, right away. Um, Alex, yeah. how little and how much can a startup raise with equity crowdfunding? Um, yeah, so startups can raise at, on, on Equivesto, the smallest that we'll do is 25,000. Um, so that's the smallest uh, target amount. And uh, in Ontario, the, the highest amount that you can raise with equity crowdfunding, uh, at least on Equivesto, is 1.5 million from the general public. Uh, it does get a little bit confusing because at the same time, while there are limits on the amount of capital you can bring in from the general public, if you're bringing capital in from accredited investors at the same time through the platform, that money while adding to uh, your your goals and the amount you're trying to raise, it doesn't uh, reduce your allowable space under the equity crowdfunding rules. So if we say equity crowdfunding can, you know, you're using the simple rules, so you're only doing up to 500,000 through, through equity crowdfunding, you could bring a second 500,000 from accredited investors at the same time and not eat up any of that $500,000 limit from the general public using uh, the same sort of campaign structure. Um, the legal structure around raising capital is rather complicated and I don't wanna bore everyone on this call with the details of that, but essentially there are um, over 10 different prospectus exemptions, which are the legal rule sets that allow companies to raise capital um, in, in the different provinces. And so you can use a few different ones at the same time, uh, depending on how they kind of mix and match. I noticed there's also a question uh, in the Q&A window about protecting sort of equity control ownership. Um, do you mind if I take a stab at that? Yeah, please read the question. I missed it. It was behind yeah. the microphone. No, that's okay. So uh, Alberto asks, um, as a young startup, how do you plan to give away equity to investors while protecting your equity as a founder? It seems like a vicious cycle or catch 22. In order to get VC funding, you have to agree to the VC's terms, but those terms are often very aggressive. And if they're 
is there's an acquisition, even in the dozens of millions, for example, there are times where founders are left with nothing. How can we go out to raise funds from investors and VCs while protecting our equity? Thank you in advance. So Alberto, great, great question. It's a rather complicated question, but essentially, you know, it's been something that's been highlighted both by Mike uh, and Mandy already around, you want to find non-dilutive funding first to get you as far as you can before you need to go out to investors. Essentially, right, your, your company is worth, let, let's, let's use a simple example, your company is worth a million dollars. You, uh, your a company is worth a million dollars now before you've gone out to raise capital. If you're looking to get an additional hundred thousand uh, dollars, your company's value is now a million dollars in what we call pre money, and then you're looking to raise a hundred thousand, so that it would go to a one million one hundred thousand dollar valuation post money. And to do that, you would need to issue new shares from your business to these new investors who are coming in for and, and giving you that additional 100,000. And so while you as a founder are not losing the shares that you already possess, your company is creating more shares out of thin air and giving it to these new investors and your ownership percentage is being diluted. And every time you go out and raise, every previous owner of shares is being diluted again. So um, the next time you go out, let's say you go out and you're, you're looking for another 100,000, but your valuation has gone up, then you and the investors from the first round, both your ownership percentage decreases as you bring in new money. The way you counter that in terms of the value of your holdings is by increasing the overall value of the business. So as long as every time each round you go out to raise capital, the value of your company and as such the price per share available has gone up, then even though your ownership percentage is slowly decreasing, uh, the value of your holdings remains the same. You specifically talk about the terms related to VC investment, and that's definitely an important piece of it when it comes to negotiating with the investors and the venture capitalists when they're coming in. One important, I don't want to sort of monopolize the whole conversation with this question. It's a long uh, question, but uh, the terms uh, will really depend on what the VC's goals are when they're coming in. Investors have their own goals, have their own timelines, and you want to make sure there's alignment when you get started. The investment is not the end of your relationship with the venture capitalist. It is the beginning. You know, you're dating beforehand. Now you're getting married. Now you're going to be married for hopefully a very long time. So your goal is to make sure that there is alignment between your goals and the goals of the investors you're bringing on. If your goal is to keep running a profitable but small business and slowly scale it, you don't want to bring in a VC that's looking for 100 times growth, a big IPO in five years and a huge exit. That is clearly a disconnect between the longer term goals of you and your business. Um, also, how successful your company has been so far gives you a different amount of bargaining power when going out to raise. A lot of VCs, yes, will ask for special liquidity provisions and protections when bringing in their funds because they want to make sure that they're guaranteed to make their returns um, when it's finally time for them to exit. And the more successful your business has been up to that point, and if there are other investors interested in joining in this round, it gives you better bargaining power when you're negotiating with that VC. But it's a very long, complicated question. I have shoot me an email and we'll have we'll have a more detailed discussion about it but i tried to cover it a little bit here <laughs> anybody else want to jump in on that or did we i think he covered it pretty well yeah i right. think so <laughs> all right um mike you know we've hit it on this a little bit and i wanted to ask you how important is your network when it comes to funding your startup yeah so very important i would say um with with grants and tax credits, it's primarily just finding people who can help you, you know, identify them and get them done. But even then, once you um, once you have identified, then you got to build a relationship, like Manny said. So if you start building those relationships, it's never too too early for that. I think you know when you get later on as well into let's say the debt or the equity, um, that dating period becomes even longer often. So you, know, you want to start that early. Um, so I would say it's, it's never too early to start building your network, but I would be more inclined to say build it properly, build it the right way. Um, one tip I would have, if you're going to a VC, the best thing is not to contact them on their website and say, hey, can you fund my company? 
you should be introduced to them. So you should find someone that they've either invested in or they know well that can introduce you. Um, I think likewise for other uh, situations, even with grants and the rest of them, if you can kind of find networks that connect you that are well perceived by the different uh, funding groups, best to go through them if you can. So uh, that, that network is, is really important. And um, I'm always impressed with people that, that you know, build a company, sell it, build another company, sell it, build another company, sell it. I mean, they're obviously very smart. They're very good. But at the end of the day, what I, I see in almost all those, which is the same thing across all of them, they all have an unbelievable networks. You know, they can hire people quickly. They can get investors quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, they're able to do that multiple times. Uh, so the, the network is really quite important. And, and how you build it is what it's all about, too. I would just add on to uh, Mike's point there um, and say, if you're looking to get funding from VCs, go on Twitter. A lot of VCs love airing anonymous dirty laundry on Twitter about bad pitches <laughs> and weird reach outs that they didn't like. And um, like any angel investor or VC, people are people. They have their own likes and dislikes, personality traits and everything. And you'll find different kinds of approaches that will, will be sort of the opposite advice potentially from VC to VC. One area where people always argue is where do you put the team slide? Do you put the team slide at the front of your pitch deck or do you put it at the back? And some teams are, uh, some VCs are like, I, I love seeing who the team is. You care about who's working with you and who's brought you to this point. Amazing. The next VC is like, I don't care who this dude is. Show me your business model. Get this team slide out of the way. So do some research on social media as well uh, to, to have a look, especially on Twitter, to see what kind of VCs are talking about and, and see if you can pick up any little tidbits before pitching them. Yeah, and to add on to that, Alex, I think the important thing is to understand each investor, what they're looking for, what they want, what they don't want, um, and even more finicky, you know, as you go towards VCs, but still exactly. important with, you know, grants and tax rates. And so figure out what they're really about. And you'll actually impress them when you meet them and say, hey, I know that you like the Montreal Canadiens and you're a biker and uh, you invest in companies that are in the food business. And they'll be like, OK, wow, this guy, he gets me, he understands he's done his homework. Um, right. That, that's always a good thing. They don't like the blanket email just showing up in their inbox with the same typo between them and the other VC that they call to complain about the blanket email that they just got from you. Uh, right. So try to personalize it as much as you can. Yeah. The other thing yeah. you can also like add is like um, have an advisor committee. A startup must like you guys are gonna be surprised how many people are looking to help the new generation or new businesses as well. But nobody's just asking them or approaching them. So we have lots of people who are retired, but they want to help the next like businesses. So please reach out to them. I always look at it as who's in the advising committee as well on the like entrepreneurs. The people who have done this kind of a scale up jobs as well. So that's really important for us to see who's there. And um, they, if they have done these kind of a scale up, they already have a loss of network as well. So when you guys are inviting them to your advisory committee, you're bringing their network at the same time as well. Right. And Alberto wants everyone to join, all of you to join his advisory board. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alberto. I, I'm honored. Sadly, I cannot accept. Uh, my job uh, prevents me from being on any other company's advisory boards, but very kind of you. Um, Manny, what are some of the other benefits of working with OCI? So the one thing I always ask questions to the company, sometimes they are raising the round of $2 million and why they are like just doing lots of application process for 250,000 that we're gonna invest, right? Like they can already easily raise it with other people. Sometimes it's good to have like a province money in their cap table as well, because our name is attached to all the ministry. Whenever somebody's doing any projects with us, any success stories, we are sharing with all the ministries, all our networks, every single highlight. So we are actually doing the PR job for them. Everybody, like sometimes ministries even ask us, okay, what are the top 10 blockchain companies that are coming around? And so if we are working with you guys, you guys are already in our network and we have invested in you. So it's easier for us to name your company and we will be able to share some of the success story with our network people. So I always say that like, a, and also it's good for your own portfolio or a cap table as well. 
when you can show, okay, we were able to convince the province to invest in us. Yeah, it seems like uh, we've got a lot of the coverage here. Like if I was an early stage startup and after listening to this, where do I go? I go to Fundica and I start searching all the different grants and loans and tax credit programs that are available in my specific area for me as a founder to get me going for the first six months. And once I have a few customers and I've got a, and it's working, maybe I head over to Alex Equivesto platform and raise a hundred grand um, to get my campaign going. And then I, I'm over talking to my friends at OCI that says, here's my 50 grand, you know, some of it I just raised from equity crowdfunding. You've got 50 K you can match for it on this program. I heard about, can we start working? And then, uh, you're you're a few hundred grand into your startup before even uh, working with investors. Sounds like fun, Craig. Let's let's start next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I really appreciate everyone taking the time today. We had some really great questions from uh, the chat room. If people want to find about more about you, Mike and Fundica, where do they go? Yeah. So just go to uh, Fundica.com. Uh, you can easily find me, Mike Lee, as well at you know Fundica on, on LinkedIn. So you know, connect with me. Um, by all means, use Fundica. The, what we have on our site is what all these big companies, and governments are all paying for. You can use the free demo site as well on our site. So Fundica.com. Um, and if you have any comments or feedback, we'd love to hear those as well. So you can also find OCI on there. And uh, we do talk about equity crowdfunding, but you know, go to go talk to Alex about that so if you're looking to do that. Yeah, we used to we used to help uh, contestants on the roadshow get ready to to pitch the investors, but there hasn't been a roadshow in a couple of years. So, uh. yeah, I just want to remind people: uh, you've got to log in to uh, sign up and log into Fundica to get to the database of stuff to look at. Uh, so you you basically yeah you're going to set up a profile with your your email and password, and you can come back and look at it. But you do need to yeah set it up. And um, last time I checked, you had 97% of the Canadian government grants and loans. Is that still the number? Yeah, what, hopefully we're, we're higher. Um, okay. There are a lot of government loans and grants and tax credits that came out, but uh, we're still in that, that territory, so over 97%. And, um, but we're always looking for comment, feedback. That, that's something we're, we always strive to get better. Great. And Manny, if people want to talk to you, and I'm sure a lot of people do, or, or some of your colleagues at OCI, where do they go? So we do have a website, like ocinnovation.ca. Like I can send you guys a link as well. And please reach out to them. And we also have a regionally, the BDs in every single city as well. So we have people in Markham, people in Mississauga, London, Windsor, wherever you guys are. Uh, please go to our website and we, you guys can figure it out which we like a VD is working in that region, or we also have a sector experts as well. Um, or you guys can quickly shoot an email to me as well, so I can connect you easily. Fantastic. And Alex, if people want to learn more about you, equity crowdfunding and Equivesto, where do they go? Yeah, equivesto.com, E-Q-U-I-V-E-S-T-O.com is the best place to go to uh, learn about Equivesto, of course, uh, that's our platform. We also have a really in-depth learning center for both um, interested investors and companies looking to raise capital that really explains the whole process and sort of what's involved. Uh, you can also feel free to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn and be happy to chat. I appreciate every you guys, you, you all taking the time uh, tonight to answer questions um, and support our audience. And I appreciate everyone taking their time out of the evening to show up and learn a little bit about how they're going to fund their startup. Thank you, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow night. See you tomorrow, Craig.